I'm telling you, I'm being overwhelmed. I was talking with uh, Brother David Price yesterday. We was having prayer over here in the morning, and like we do on Saturday, and we got to talking about it. And boy, I just was, <laughs> I hope I wasn't talking too much. I probably was. <laughs> but anyway, he was taking it all in, and we were almost in tears. I mean, you know, just that it was the power and the excitement of the Word and what it means to us. And that's the thing I, I'm praying. We'll keep cultivating that church. I want us to cultivate a hunger for and a passion, you see, for the Word of God. And then not just that, but to apply it, you see, put it to practice, find ways that we can implement it, in, and let's, let's go with it. Amen? I'll tell you what, when you do, you're going to see. <laughs> it's, it's, all you need to do is put your faith together with the Word, and it's like putting nitro and glycerin together. Boom! <laughs> you're going to get something to happen, praise God. And uh, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I look out this room, I see living testimonies. I'm standing here as a living testimony, see, that the Word works. Amen. And so we stand on the Word. And sometimes we have to do it for a season. But the Bible talks about seasons. See, there are seasons of change and seasons where God will do one thing and then he's going to move eventually to another thing. And it's a season that we're in right now. And, you know, a tree doesn't produce, uh, a fruit tree doesn't produce fruit all the time. And when it's not time, here's another good thing to know. When it's not the season for them to put out the fruit, listen, I haven't seen any trees groaning and going, Ugh. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm trying to make some fruit here. <laughs> you know, have you seen them do that? No, they don't do that. Because what are they doing? They're putting roots down, you see. They're being nurtured and they're being pruned maybe a little bit. And so they can. And when they do put the fruit out, it's going to be even more fruit. Praise God. So that's just one area of, of the way the seasons of the Lord operate in our life. I've preached some, some messages about the seasons uh, that we go through in life. And but thank God that that, they, that God's always got a springtime. <laughs> He's always got a time for harvest. Amen. Always praise the Lord. And so we just have to keep trusting and and do our part and sow when it's time to sow. Amen. All right. Well, let's see. I want to let's switch gears. I got to move on because I got something really um, bubbling in my heart here today. And we're going to talk today about rest. Remember last week I talked with you about learning to rest. Just we need to learn to rest. And a lot of things we talked about, I'll give you just a, a little quick uh, review. And, and by the way, this title today, The Promise of Rest, okay, the promise, say it with me, the promise of rest. Now, the thing that I'm going to really try to get across to you today, the main idea, that rest is a place. Rest is a place in God, you see. And because it's a place... We have to know we have to enter it. When you came to the church this morning, you came to the front and the open door, and here it was, the church is a place. And you had to enter through the doors to come in to participate and get in on uh, Pastor Mike playing the banjo. <laughs> and uh, Larry picked the guitar, and Dale lead the worship, and and hear all of the other things. Once you entered in. Man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. <laughs> I was thinking that over, and all of a sudden it just dawned on me. Tell them <laughs> that this rest we're talking about is actually a place in God. And the Bible's full of the testament about it. That that was the whole thing. The children of Israel were on their way leaving Egypt because God had a place for them. And much of our prayers today is that Lord help Israel to keep their place. 
Some people wanting to take their place away from them. Others wanting to destroy them, wipe them off the face of the earth. But don't worry about it, church. God has always had a place. <laughs> and when you start to realize it and you study it, it takes a lot of this heaviness and this, uh, you know, feeling of, oh, what's going on? What's wrong? No, no. Now I know I'm okay. Why? I entered. <laughs> I entered that place of rest. And I'll tell you what, there's many times when I'm challenged and I, you know, I, I'm, I, I can start losing my cool. <laughs> Anyone else here beside me? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> it happens. It happens, okay? But then I have to remember, uh oh, wait a minute, I, I stepped out of this place. I better step back in this place of rest. Now, that's the bottom line, okay? Now, a few points here. I said to you that um, we have been called, we've been called into the rest. Say it with me. We've been called into the rest by Jesus himself, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. We've talked about it quite a bit. And he said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. So we've been called. And then the rest, you see, I told you last week is a requirement for building for God. You remember, David said, I am not the one that can build the temple. God told me. And he even gave me the name of the son that I would have, call him Solomon, and he's the one who's going to build the temple. Why? Because you've been a man of war, David, but I need a man of rest. It's in the Bible. <laughs> and so if you don't enter this rest we're talking about, you're not going to be in the right position to build. Or oh, you might do a few things. But it's not going to be lasting. It won't be fruit that remains. It will be a passing thing that will not develop. The thing that God wants to develop and build and make right is the thing that comes out of a spirit of rest. Amen? And you all know it's true. <laughs> just go ahead. You don't have to say nothing. Just shake your head. That'd be good enough. <laughs> it's the truth. You have to be at rest. That's one we, thing we taught you last week. Now, here's another biggie. Remember what I told you about this one? Jesus is our banner of rest. Now, unfortunately, the video that we made last week, we had a little error in the way the audio was going on. And the reason why it sounds distant, it sounds like I'm talking from across the room. And the reason is because we weren't able for some reason to get this microphone to go. And so all we was recording was the microphones in the cameras. See, we can, we can also tap those. So there's a microphone in the cameras. And that's what we pulled it in. But if you will just be patient and listen close, <laughs> you know, put your headphones on or whatever you need to do, the, the word is there, okay? And, and I, I would really want to encourage you to listen to it. It's there for a purpose. And the reason why we're, we're doing this is because we're building. And we're building line upon line, precept upon precept. One thing connects to the other, and it shows you the building of God and how God builds, how he orchestrates, how he does things. And that's why he said, come get in the yoke with me, you see, and learn from me. And I'm going to show you my ways. My ways are actually past finding out for men that you have to do it in the spirit. Spiritually, things are spiritually discerned, and that's what we have to start doing more of. Can you say amen? Amen. <clears throat> amen. All right. Well, what did I tell you that I was going to be doing? I Remember last week I said, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to give me an answer. Those of you that weren't here, I would say this. What kind of banner do we have? And the answer is a banner of rest. So I'm going to try it again. What kind of banner do we have? A banner of rest. You know, just like I would say, you know, about God, and they go, yes, he's always big, big God. We, we, we know that. We answer back, this is a new one, and I'm going to be saying it to you uh, off and on here. What kind of banner do we have? Wow. Now, there you go. And I want you to get that stamped in your spirit, see. 
I want you to understand that that is where we are to be, to live like that. Now, Jesus, if you go listen to the teaching, you'll see what I talked about, about the banner. Jesus was the banner. The scriptures in Isaiah prophesied that he was coming, and there was this one that would be the banner of rest. And Jesus was the banner of rest on the cross, you see, waving rest. And I'm going to tell you some more about that in just a little bit. Now, we also mentioned that God's rest is different than natural rest. And I gave you a list of some of the differences. You've got to go down to get up. Down on your knees, you're taller than trees. There's, You see, and, and sometimes you have to give something away to get to keep it, like even your life, okay? So there's these things that seem so different uh, to our way of thinking. And then the final thing I'll say before we move forward, it takes faith, dear ones. It takes faith. These are something, this is something you have to operate in faith because we can't really see it literally, but we understand it spiritually and we move into it and do it anyway. Can you say amen? And I have to commend Many, many of you that I've observed you doing this very thing. So let's just keep it up, church. That's what we want. All right, now, let's go. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay, number one, if you're writing some notes, there's this promise of rest. See, rest was part of the promise. So when we sing, standing on the promises... You see, that is part of what he was saying to us through promise. Go to Hebrews, okay? Open up your word, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. And um, I'm not going to read them all, but here's what it's saying. I want you to know, that I'm laying some background. We're laying some groundwork here. Understand this. That passage right there it talks about how it was unbelief, that kept the Israelites out of God's promise of rest. The promise was there for them. It wasn't a problem with the promise. The problem was with unbelief. And because they would not believe. And you know that the spies and all of that came back. And, and, and t you know out of ten, there was only two that had a good report. The others were not in faith. And if you go now with me to uh, the chapter 4, go over there. And, and let's look at this for a minute. Go to Hebrews chapter 4 and uh, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains. Now, that's the good news. The good news is because they flubbed the dub and they didn't do what they were supposed to do, they didn't wipe out the promise. Now, aren't you glad about that? I think we ought to hear a big amen right there. <laughs> a big amen. The promise remains, you see. Okay, of entering his rest. Dear ones, there it is in black and white. It's right in the Bible. <laughs> so let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Oh, boy, that should be our constant prayer. Lord, don't let me come short. Don't let me bow out. Don't let me move into unbelief. Don't let me go away from this, but let me hold on to this. No, I'm so pleased with, you know, how I see this principle being lived out in you. But I'm wanting to challenge you to do it even more and really understand. It. What I'm praying is, God, help me to put handles. I want people to be able to grasp this truth and hold on. Sometimes we know about it. It's kind of out there and, and uh, you know, nebulous, but we didn't really grab it. I want us to grab hold of it. Some of you have grabbed hold of it. And so when you're hearing me preach, it's like, amen, Pastor Mike, because I've got it. I understand what you're talking about. And so, you know, you can say amen to me. You know, you say amen to me, it's like saying sick him to a dog. <laughs> you know, go and let them know. It'll get me excited. And I want to I wanna go for it, you know, when I hear you guys uh, amen me. <laughs> Is that, yeah, praise God. There we go. So let's move on. I want you to see some more. Verse 2. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us 
as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, mm -mm, not being mixed with faith. Didn't I tell you earlier, you have to have faith to enter this rest. And in those who have heard it, you see, it didn't take. And why didn't it take? Is because they didn't have faith to uh, step out on it. You must step out. You know, they give Peter sometimes a, a bad rap because he stepped out of the boat and almost drowned. <laughs> but he stepped out of the boat. Amen. Come on. Right. And, uh, and so we have to learn that we have got to operate in faith. Verse 3, for we who have believed do enter that rest. That was his declaration. For we who believe have entered that rest. Amen. So what I'm saying with this is there's a promise of rest, and God has told us that it's there for us. And he continues to explain to us how that there's this spiritual place of rest, and it's a place. And you have to enter into it. And so if you're not in rest and you're shook up, guess what? <laughs> you need to move back in it. Sometimes, you know, I've told you, we say, well, I'm not as close to God as I would like to be or was before. And my question is, well, who moved? <laughs> he said, I will never forsake you. <laughs> oh, hello. So he's not the one that's moving. And circumstances and situations that come in our life will cause us to see a little fog. And we're not seeing clear. And we're not as in tune as we need to be to really have this rest. Oh, but when you step into this rest, wow. You know what I'm saying, church. There's nothing like it. And the whole world could be falling apart and falling down everywhere around you. But it's like, I'm okay. Hallelujah. Verse 11, let's go there. Let us, therefore, be diligent, it says in the New King James. Uh, let's look at a couple of other uh, translations quickly. Um, in the in the original King James, it uses this word labor, and I like that. There's some of the things that I were in the original King James. I, I think I like it better. It, it kind of says it better. But he says this, to labor, labor to enter the rest. This one here says be diligent to enter it. And then the, the NET, you know, the New English translation, sometimes I like that one. And it says, we must make every effort to enter. Hello? Uh, just some effort, a little bit of effort. Uh, you know, maybe I'll try it uh, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> you know, no, no. It needs to be moved up on the top shelf up there and say, this is so important. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, here's the deal. Here's the deal. When you are in that rest, you see, things will happen almost effortless. Things will start coming together, shaping up and happening in ways that will mystify you. It will just sort of like, whoa. And I like to say it like this, that was a God thing. <laughs> that was a God thing. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, that's the way I've learned to live. And whenever I move away from that, I'm telling you what, I hate that. I don't want to be out of that. I need to be in that. And, you know, there's so many things that happen that pull me out of it. And I'm saying, no, 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 I got to have that. Uh, you could put it like this. I, I'm, I'm kind of spoiled. <laughs> the Lord's got to. And you know what? It's okay to spoil me that way. Why? Because I'm his baby. I'm his child. And when I came home, well, he said, kill a fatted calf. Get the ring. Come on, put a robe on them. Hey, we're going to have a party. Come on, you're home. And that's our Father's heart for us. Can you say amen? And boy, what a feeling of rest. You know, that young boy, when he came home, I mean, he knew he blew it bad. <laughs> but when he got home and it was like, oh, thank 
God, <laughs> you know? And that's where we can live, church. It's a place. Return to it. That little story is another way to see the example of what we're talking about. The Father's heart is a place to come to. You're going to find rest in it. And you're going to go, whew, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. And I'm telling you what, if I stop and just pause for a moment and think about it, I can start getting pretty weepy. <laughs> it's overwhelming. The love of the Father. You know, the Lord showed me something this last week, and I'll probably preach about it later, but it's so good. I was talking to David yesterday about it. The Lord showed me something about Samson. I used to love Samson, and I always was a little puzzled. Well, why did he have to die at the end? <laughs> you know, what was that all about? And as I was studying this thing about rest and what I'm going to tell you later about Jesus on the cross saying it is finished, it was he was a forerunner of that experience of Jesus going to the cross. And when he pulled down those pillars in that temple, he was destroying all of these sinful people. You see what I mean? They were terrible people, and they were doing terrible things, and, the, and all kinds of sad, sick stuff going on. And, and he, in his last moments, did more to finish them off than anything else he'd ever done, even though he'd killed thousands with the jawbone of a donkey and, and he'd done all these great feats of strength. But the end was where he was pulling down the kingdom that he was in of the world. And Jesus, there was, on the cross, was pulling down the sin and the kingdom of this world. Man, do you get that? And our God is so detailed that he put that story together for us to be able to see the forerunner of what the power of God would do, pulling down the kingdoms <laughs> of the world. Listen, we win, church. Hallelujah. We're the victors. Hallelujah. And we can rest in that truth. Hallelujah. Man, I tell you, you now I think you can start seeing why I'm so thrilled about this idea of entering God's rest. It's the place for us, church. It's the place for us. So we have to enter into it. <coughs> so we could say it like this. In Christ, we are in the promised land <laughs> of rest. It's a promised land of rest. <laughs> and it's ours. It was always part of the plan in the heart of God. He started out by showing us a beautiful thing called the Garden of Eden. And that's, it was his idea of beauty. And man spoiled it. <laughs> and ever since, he's been at working to make it right again. And guess what? I'm saying it a little early, but I was going to say it later. Might as well say it. Jesus was the second man, Adam. He came on the scene to correct what the first Adam messed up on. And it also says that he was also the firstborn of many brethren. Listen, he was the firstborn of many brethren. So what is that telling us? We're kin. We're kin. We're family. You see what I mean? We're part of that. So after he was born and started something, then all of the others throughout history have come on the scene and a new one's born. A new one's born. Here's another one. Here's another one. And look around the room. Here we are. You see, praise God. Whew. That's another whole one. I could preach for a while on that. <laughs> okay, now. I see time's slipping away from me, but, but I've got to move on to something very important. Look, go with me now to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, uh, chapter 3, 1 and 2. And I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. Uh, it says it very well. Ruth, chapter 3, 
1 and 2. Now, here's the thing about Ruth. You know, the book of Ruth is in the Bible for a very special, specific reason. It's not just a nice story, even though it is a beautiful story. I mean, there's some romance in there, you know. I mean, there's, there's, it's beautiful, <laughs> all these things that happen. And as I was a young person growing up in the church, we'd hear about the book of Ruth and talk about the book of Ruth. And I always thought of it as just kind of a flower garden where you walk in the Bible and it's a beautiful story. But I still didn't get it. And the more I've looked at it, something jumped out at me when I was thinking about rest. <laughs> Look at this. And I'm going to tell you more about why Ruth is in the Bible, why that book is there, okay? It says this in the New Living Translation. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, and she thought of her as a daughter, even though she was a daughter-in-law, it's time that I found a permanent home for you and so that you will be provided for. And Boaz is a close relative of ours. And he's been very kind. Now, here's the thing that you need to realize. Boaz is a type of Christ. And the idea here is that his kindness, you see, and his generosity, and he was going to do something. See, he's also uh, mentioned when we talk about him as the kinsman redeemer. That's what he's called. Theologians and others who study the scriptures understand he is the kinsman redeemer which is the type of christ see christ is also and was and still is our kinsman redeemer and i just told you how he became our kinsman <laughs> he's the firstborn of many brethren he came to correct what adam did and if we're all seed of adam adam was the first one and then populated the whole earth and there we have it so we see Christ, the kinsman, pictured in this story. And I want you to know, dear ones, that is the reason that Ruth is even in the Bible. It's the story about this kinsman redeemer. And that had to be in the Bible to tell us about the one that was still coming. Now, if you got that, say amen. amen. Okay. And I looked at it in some other translations. I like it in that, uh, that new English translation, too. It says, and Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, I must find a home for you so that you'll be secure. I want you to catch that part, to be secure. Now, this idea of home, I looked it up. And here's what it says in the King James the original. Shall I not seek rest? For thee, <laughs> there it is. That's why I like King James. It sometimes tips us off on things that need to be still there. And that was the biggie to me. When I saw that in the original King James and I said, I want to seek a rest place for you. And I started studying it and I found out how big this idea of rest was. What it was talking about was this place of security, this place where you could be knowing that all will be well with you. Man, I hope you got that. <laughs> I better say that. It's a place where you will know that all will be well with you. And that's the thing I want you to see about this. We can enter this place I'm talking about of rest and all doubts will leave you about whether you'll be okay or not. And you can, you see what I mean? And enter in to the season of rest at all times. It's just that simple. And all you have to do is operate your faith to go back to the Word of God and look at it and say, Listen, it's here. It's in the Word. It's, it's there for me. And I'm going to take hold of this Word. And so, devil, you just might as well pack your bags and get out of here right now. <laughs> and stop this whispers and lies and all of this stuff that you're doing. I refuse to receive that because I'm going to be a person of rest. 
And even like David, he, he couldn't build the temple. He had to let his son Solomon because he was the man of rest. Now, do you want to build for God, church? Do you want to be able to build something that's going to remain? Are you wanting to build something that's going to last, going to make change? Hallelujah! <laughs> we can only do it if we enter rest. Good preaching, Pastor Mike, I'm telling you. <laughs> there we go. It's, I have to amen myself sometimes. <laughs> All right. Now, with that in mind, go over to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to see the parallel, what's going on here. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And I'm going to tell you what's going on there. It's it's really the story explaining why Ruth was in the Bible. That whole book was in the Bible because of what we find in Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, let's look at it for a second here. Actually, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. And we have forgiveness of sins according to his riches and grace. What is it talking about? It's talking about the mercy and the kindness, you see, of the Lord. The same thing that Ruth found in Boaz. You see what I mean? And so that's where this blessing comes in. And verse 9, look at this. He speaks of a mystery. That is huge. If you haven't marked verse 9, you need to, because this mystery is mentioned many times in the Scripture. And what was this mystery all about? You see, that was something, even though it seemed mysterious about Boaz, it was kind of a mysterious story, how they ended up and how it turns out that they're kind of family, they're connected, and, and he starts showing kindness. Why did he do that? Well, it was part of this whole thing, this mysterious thing, this kinsman redeemer, you see, made known the mystery of his father's will that it become a place of rest and security. So Ruth was being blessed by this experience of this kinsman, you see what I mean, that was bringing her in to establish her a place of rest. Man, I thought by now you guys would be running all over the church. <laughs> Woo! Man, I'll tell you what, this will put goosebumps on your goosebumps. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you know, Boaz, even though it was a mysterious thing, and we look at that little book in the Bible and we say, what a sweet little story. Whoa, it was a huge thing that was being put in the Bible for us. So this kinsman redeemer obtained an inheritance. It says it right there, verse 11, look what he says. And in him also... We have obtained an inheritance. So the very same thing was going on with Jesus that we saw the picture of Boaz who brought Ruth in and made her a part and gave her this place. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Man, you're so good to us, Lord. And so Jesus became this person that played that role and I love uh, the scriptures that describes it in Romans 8, 28, I mean 29, uh, right after 28. Uh, and the firstborn he was, you see, of many brethren, and made him our kinsman redeemer. And so because of that, we can know him in that way. Now, here's the thing. He provides, Jesus provides for us an entrance into rest. How can we get there? Through the gate. He's the only one. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. And we have to enter through him. And so our resting place is in him. We must go to him. And in him, you see, we can find, here's the beautiful thing. It's called the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. The Lord told me, tell him about this. <laughs> so I'm going to close with this. We want to understand and grab hold of the mind of Christ. You say, why is that so important, Pastor? Because the mind of Christ is a restful mind. Jesus is always at rest. And in uh, 
Philippians 2 and 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And if you back up to verse 2, it says, Being like-minded, having the same love, being in one accord and in one mind. How many know what a blessing that is? That's what we want. Listen, that's a little heaven on earth right there. When you get with people and you're in the same mind, that's what draws us week after week together and to long to be in the fellowship of those who all believe this. Can you say amen? amen. That we be like-minded, that we have the Spirit of Christ upon us, that we have the mind of Christ. It's a restful mind. I had a few things I wanted to say I put down. It's a restful mind. It's a secure mind. It's a renewed mind. It's a gentle mind. It's a mind centered on Christ. It's a mind led by the Holy Spirit. It's a mind resting on the promises of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> and it's uh, with no worries and no doubts. You see, it's with no fear, no sadness, no sorrows, because it's all in him. Hallelujah. He removes those things. And he gives you a little heaven to go to heaven in and with. Won't it be wonderful there? We used to sing, won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear, joyously singing, with joy bells all ringing, won't it be wonderful there? Hallelujah. And you know what? We can have some of that now as we enter this rest. And I'm telling you, we could sing that song about entering rest. Won't it be wonderful <laughs> there? That's where we want to be, and that's what God's showing us that we can be. And all of those months that I suffered and went through those problems last year, God was fine-tuning me. God was renewing me. God was restoring and bringing me back to things that I needed to be on top of and being able to bring to you. And so now it's like a fountain, and I can't turn it off. It's just <laughs> it's a gusher, and it just keeps coming and keeps coming all the time. So we want to see these things, don't we? Because when you have the mind of Christ, we can say, it is well. <laughs> it is well. We enter his rest, and it's not just for our physical, even though we do need it for that, of course. But it's a mental, emotional, and spiritual time of rest and being restored, which makes me think also of the Shudamite woman. Some of you know about the Shudamite woman. You know, Elisha and her was connected. And remember, she made this special place for him to stay when he would pass through. And he, she prayed, he prayed over her to have a child. She had a child. The child grew up, and then the child got sick and died. So she goes to see Elisha. You know the story. <laughs> and he says, well, how's everybody? How's your husband? How's your child? How's everything? And she says, it is well. The boy is laying dead at home. <laughs> she says, it is well. boy and that song rings in my ears how could it is well it is well with my soul see it's so powerful because she knew how and had entered that place that I'm talking about she knew about that rest and her confidence was in that Everything was in that. And she wasn't being affected by all of these things that she saw happening and experiencing. She kept her eyes straight where they belonged. And she could say, it is well. The Lord wants to teach us that. I'm telling you, the whole Spirit's been talking to me. Listen, <laughs> learn to do that. 
learn to be like that. And so I'm praying, Lord, help me to stay in that place of rest. Don't let me leave it. So that I can always say, it is well. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's storms. Oh, yeah, there's problems. Oh, yeah, there's things going on around you. But we can say, it is well. <laughs> it is well. And so as we close, I want to repeat a little bit of what I told you about Jesus on the cross because it's so important as we close. What did he say on the cross? The last words he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. See, he gave up his spirit. No one took it away from him. He gave it up. And he said, it is finished. But there's so much about what he said. We got to grab it. What was he doing when he said, it is finished? He was closing the door to this, his last responsibility as a bleeding Savior sent to bring his Father's love to the world. I want you to hear this. He was closing that door. But at the same time, dear ones, he was opening, <laughs> he was opening another door. He was opening the entrance into the promise place of that divine rest. And it was finished. I'm moving on, never to go back. And what I feel that we should hear in that is this. Dear ones, God wants us to step into this door. And the old is finished. I have no place there. I have no desire for that. I never want to be in that place. <laughs> Can you say amen? I want to be in the new place. And it's the place of rest. It's the place of mercy. It's the place of victory. It's the place of resurrected life. Can you say amen? Where God fills us with so much that it overflows like David said. My cup runneth over. Hallelujah. I have rest about it. I have peace about it. It's okay. And I can say it's well with me. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Give the Lord a clap offering. Man. Praise you, Lord. Man. Oh, praise God. If I was uh, talking with the black pastor down in Gilroy, which I do sometimes, I'd say, listen, that, that will preach. <laughs> that will preach. Hallelujah. Why? Because it's alive. It's a word of truth. It's the word that God has for each and every one of you, dear ones. And so we want to grab a hold of it and understand it. Praise the Lord. Roxanne's going to come and help me. And we had a song here. What did I do with it? <laughs> I got it out and did something with it. I don't know what I did with it. Do you have music? Mm -hmm. You want it? Yeah, you play it. <laughs> She's so good. She doesn't need that. <laughs> it's on the cord. Amen. I felt the Lord tell me to do this song. It's an old song, but it's got a good message for us for right now. Remember, I mentioned it to you last week, and I said, we're going to do it. Uh, we could probably put it on over there. Let's see. Let me put it over here. go by spirit power. I, it's my fault. I should have explained it ahead of time, and I, I didn't. So, And if you do find it, that'd be great. It's, it's called uh, The Haven of Rest, 
and we'll uh, we'll go to do it now. How's that? All right. Now I'm going to sing the verse first, and then we'll move to the chorus. And I want you to uh, understand the power of this message. It's called, I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. The haven of rest. That's where we want to go. And that's the place of safety. That's the place of security. That's the place in God where all is well, church. Can you say amen? And so I want us to uh, sing this little song. And we'll start with this. I yielded myself to his tender embrace in faith taking hold of the word my feathers fell off and I anchored my soul the haven of rest is my Lord. Now with rhythm, we'll pick it up. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest, in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep o'er the wide stormy deep in Jesus I'm safe evermore I'm going to sing this one how precious the thought that we all may recline <laughs> you see like John the beloved so blessed on Jesus strong I am and no tempest can harm secure where in the haven of rest come on let's enter it I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep, the tempest may sweep or the wide, over the wide stormy deep. But in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Now, Lord, we thank you for those words of that song touching the heart of some dear one way back when. But what a truth. And it's still real. It's still for us. It still has a great message and is something that we need to understand. So, Lord, we ask now your spirit to come. Take hold of us. Draw us, Lord, into that deeper place in you.